In this special two-part episode, we bring you Dr. Kakenya Ntaya. Her story is absolutely remarkable. She has been a CNN hero, one of Newsweek's 150 women who shake the world, and the first youth advisor to the United Nations Population Fund. She was the first girl to ever leave her Maasai village in southern Kenya to attend school in the United States. Kakenya, as she is known around the world, earned a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, and she has returned to her homeland to start a school for girls, the Kakenya Center for Excellence. But the dark secret that Kakenya had to live through just to get to go to school is something we should all know about. Dr. Kakenya and Taya. Uh, I grew up in a small Maasai village in southwestern Kenya. And it is a village that um, had no running water and no electricity. Um, I have, I have, um, I grew up in a, a small family. Mm -hmm. small, um, a small family, uh, but you had eight, we other, had eight people eight, in your family. Yeah, we have. Uh, That's a big family to me. <laughs> two brothers and five sisters, so we're eight of us. Um, Are you the oldest, the youngest, or somewhere in the middle? I'm the oldest. Sure. Um, I say small because in my community, people like uh, men can marry up to four or five wives. Uh -huh. So in each home, each wife can have 10 kids. So in one family, you might even find 50 children. Wow. So my dad um, just married my mom. So was the, we were a small family. Oh, small family. Okay, <laughs> um, you said you're Maasai? Yes, I'm Maasai. Um, the Ma Maasai have, a dis have distinctive characteristics. Can you kind of describe that? <laughs> um, the Maasai people are very... We love ourselves and we love our culture and we really try as much as possible to remain as um, native as, 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 as we can. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we, we have a set of values, like there is a way that our boys brought up, so there are traditions that they have to go to become, you know, there are stages in life, you know, mm -hmm. there are kids, there are, you know, boys, they are Morans, they are elders, and they grow, you know, there's that channel. The same thing for, for women, uh, for it's a girl, and then she goes through uh, a, a flight of passage, she becomes mm -hmm. uh, a woman, she gets mm -hmm. married, um, uh, it depends on how many kids you have, so there's a level of, um, uh, and, and we are very traditional, and we love ourselves, of course, we used to be nomads, uh, very few of us are nomads now, yeah. but um, you know, in growing up, we cow. The cow is the most precious thing. I mean, if you want to love, you know, if you want to surprise a Maasai man, especially, you give them cows. Um, mm. We we love our cows. That's where our meals come from. Yeah. From drinking the milk to um, initially, we used to do the tradition of drinking the blood and all that. Um, we've, we've stopped. <laughs> Most of us whoa, have. Whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> the, the traditional drinking of cow's blood? Yeah, we, I mean, it's, a, it's our way of, form of nutrition um, because we would, um, as children, they would mix the milk and the blood and you'll drink it um, from the cow. And you did that? Uh, yes, I did. And yeah. um, yes, um, I wouldn't even, do I, it now. <laughs> Well you, well, you run a school in Kenya, so do they drink cow's blood? No, <laughs> no, no, we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. We, we, we've, we've evolved. Um, mm. We now, uh, we, you know, some parts of us, like my community, we do farming. So we mm -hmm. really like depending on, you know, corn, maize, and other forms of... Uh, mm. So here in, the, here in the United States, I, I rarely hear the word Maasai by itself. It's almost mm -hmm. always the Maasai warriors. Mm hmm are you uh, warriors? Warriors are men. Uh, women are not warriors. Um, because the process of, it is that, as I was saying earlier, there's a distinction between mm -hmm. a woman and a man. Mm -hmm. uh, warriors are warriors because they are the ones who go out and protect their family. Um, when we were, you know, there's an initiation of <clears throat> they kill a lion and they, you know, they show that they are brave men and they're out. Um, so women are not really, you know, considered. Um, was that bravery to you? I mean, um, 
Did you perceive that a man that goes out and kills a lion is a brave man? Growing up, yes, that's what we believed. But right now, it's a very different concept. Like, I believe that women have a very strong um, spirit. They are the protectors of families in terms of feeding, in terms of... Um, uh, it's one of the things that I studied is to look at the life of a woman, a Maasai woman. Um, she wakes up at five in the morning, mm -hmm. um, milking cows, making sure that they, you know, the family is having breakfast. You know, mm -hmm. making sure was, that was that your mom's? Yeah, yeah, my mom did all that. So looking at the the, the, the life that she she lived, um, mm -hmm. in making sure that there is food on the table, making sure that we went to school, and she worked hard, and um, the men uh, pretty much stand around and see what the women are doing. Um, they just move from one home to another one and drinking tea here, drinking, you know, eating food here. So it's a, well, how did that make you feel? In growing up, that was the culture and that was acceptable to me, but because that's what everybody did. Um, and I didn't know anything else because you saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's, it's sometimes it makes me angry. Um, I, I tend to, um, because I, I believe that uh, if, if you're supposed to be a man, the warrior, the strong, then you're supposed to protect your family. You're not supposed to abuse your wife, for example, beating women, um, because my dad used to abuse my mom. So that is not a brave man. And, you know, making sure that, um, you know, the food is home. Um, but what we find that most men, they're just out eating in bars and drinking, you know, in the bars, and they're not bringing anything to the house. The Messiah men? <clears throat> yes, they just go roaming around and really most don't do anything. <laughs> they don't do anything. I mean, the wife brings water for him to wash and washes the clothes for him. And, and he just, he's just a figure. Hmm. So he's just a figure. And it's, so that's... Well, it, yeah, that I don't agree with now. And and I, I understand when you were five years old, you already knew who you were going to marry. Yes. <laughs> I grew up... Um, but that wasn't your choice. No, because uh, for us, it's, um, you know, because my mother was very hardworking, mm -hmm. um, so the other families are looking out for their sons, too. It's, you know, they had to book me like ensure that I, I can get married to their son because because of the characteristics of my mother i was going to turn out to be a good wife so mm -hmm. <laughs> what is, what does that mean you they were gonna they were booking you they were already lining you up this is the man for you because yes. what yes. why would why does this man get to be your husband as opposed to some other man or were there because, several men i mean in this it, he he plays he he is the first one to place um there is a chain that they put on my neck so yeah. he put that on my neck um oh, really? i don't even know probably three or four years so i just grew up knowing like oh there was a chain and <laughs> three or four years old yes <laughs> yeah. um and of course, his mother and my mother called themselves the the one. So there was a chain around your neck from yes. a three or four year old boy. <laughs> no, the boy was older than oh, me. Oh, he was older. A oh. little bit older, and I was younger. Um, so when I was at that age, that's when they put the chain. So I was engaged. Did you have a big engagement party at, at age of no, three? No, there's no engagement party. It's just more like a symbol um, that that. It's not really a big celebration. It's just like knowing that you've been booked and then constantly being told, oh, your husband just passed by. Oh, so-and-so. Your mother-in-law is here. <laughs> really? Did you even know at age, at, at age three or four or five or, <clears throat> or six, did you even know what a mother-in-law was? Yeah, of course. I mean, when you're five, yeah. Because, right. yeah, I mean, you knew that it's the mother of your husband. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I guess what I'm trying to understand is that at that age, you even know what a husband is. No, I think because of our culture and our expectations that, you know, we we are trained as girls. When, when we grow up, um, you know that your ultimate um, big thing is to get married and have children. Linda Lockhart saw a need to help girls in Kenya, so she started the Global Give Back Circle to do just that. Now, here's Linda Lockhart with a Global Give Back Circle graduate, Mary Mwende. 
So <laughs> that's how it started, and today the program is that. A girl gets a mentor, she gets the funding that she needs, everything from soap to Shakespeare, to make sure she doesn't fall through the cracks. But the most important thing is she's got to give back. And she mm -hmm. has to commit to giving back. And they actually have learned to give back by reading President Clinton's book, Giving. Mm -hmm. Every girl reads it. Every year a give back commitment is made. Every year a progress um, report is done. And for the past four years, we've invited someone from um, CGI to come and facilitate those workshops. So it's kind of a big, fun aha moment um, in Kenya when that happens. And we've embedded in them um, a give back ethos and, and, and give back skills just as much as we've embedded in them financial literacy, reproductive health, and leadership. And then uh, when I went to Dubai, my give back commitment was teaching English to construction laborers who um, have been left out uh, and they're living in, in camps. And if you teach them English, they get a promotion at least. They get to be, you know, traffic officers or just something to help them move on and, you know, feel much better about themselves. Yes. The Global Give Back Circle started because of the Clinton Global Initiative. I made a commitment in 2008, and you know I came from private sector, knew nothing about this development world, but the Clinton Global Initiative pretty much gives you a roadmap to follow and allows you to hook up to people and put you in whisper rooms and CGI Connect, and at the end of it, I, I came out with some amazing partners, Microsoft being one of them, USAID, MasterCard Foundation, and together they galvanized together um, as a team, and we now have the largest program in Kenya for tertiary education for at-risk girls that take them into employment. So where there are a lot of um, organizations who help them in primary school, in secondary mm -hmm. school, we have the largest one that takes them after that. I remember the first interview we did, and I think that you were working very hard on the 35 girls who were in the program, yes. and it's grown a little bit. Yes, right? <laughs> one of the first 35. <laughs> that was 2008. Wow, 2008. And now we're up to almost 600. So Mary, uh, I understand the congratulations are in order because the last time we talked you were a student, but now you're not anymore. <laughs> yes. Because you, you graduated. Yes, I did. And coming from a dad's point of view, big congratulations because you're employed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. How'd you do that? Um, having been in the school, the American University in Dubai, I mean, I have, um, I was very active as a student and I built a lot of good rapport with um, a lot of staff, faculty, and um, as soon as I graduated, um, it was only uh, it was only a matter of um, applying for a job and getting it in the university. So you were a you, you are from Kenya. Yes, I and am. to get you to the university, were you just a super privileged child, or was there something else that helped you? When it comes to finances, no. When it comes to a mother who had the drive to push me, yes, I was super privileged. Um, but um, even with the drive of a mother who wants to push you through without other, um, other people who can help you, other support systems who can help you get to university, you can't really make it. So that's where the Global Give Back Circle came in, started by Linda Lockhart in 2006. Um, it was introduced in Starehe Girls Center, and I was very lucky to be among the first 10 girls to be chosen to get into the Global Give Back Circle. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I got into university. Got to brag about you just a little bit. You were <laughs> like president of everything there at, at the University of uh, Dubai, right? I was the president of the Student Government Association. <laughs> Yes, at the American University in Dubai. And was she was a Clinton scholar. A Did Clinton? you know that? No. Yes. yes. <laughs> wow. So, yes, I was um, a Clinton scholar. Linda, are, are you patting yourself on the back? Or I guess everybody's patting you on the back because of, of the things that you did to help her. No, I, I, I'm patting her on the back. She did it all herself. I'm patting her on the back, too. <laughs> so the program itself, um, how has it changed since Mary started? That's a good question, um, and Mary, I'm going to ask you to help me. In the yeah. beginning, when Mary was in the program, we really didn't know what it was. It was a mentoring program, and we thought we would get girls into university. And as you learn, because we, we've learned, this is 2006 we started, what else does she need to get into employment? 
She needs reproductive health skills. She needs financial literacy skills. She needs leadership skills. She needs um, employment readiness skills. And those are things we didn't think about in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's much more comprehensive now. And when we do go and ask for a sponsorship of a girl, mm -hmm. we make sure that all those pieces are in place. Because if they're not, someone could sponsor a girl to go to university in Kenya, but if they didn't, if we didn't take care of the reproductive health training, she would get pregnant, possibly. Mm -hmm. If we didn't do financial literacy, she may not know how to manage her money when she leaves. So the difference is now it's much more holistic. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's all done through mentors, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You had a mentor. Yes, Who I have she? a mentor. Um, my mentor's name is Charlie Gower. She's British. She lives in London. And um, I've had her since 2006. And apart from her being my mentor, I have um, she's mentored through me through a lot of um, a lot of situations, difficulties, decisions, and I also have a lot of people who have helped me and coached me through as well. Um, so I I have a lot of mentors in my life. I have one that I've been matched with at the Global Give Back Circle, and I have coaches like Linda. She's my coach. Um, and I've been blessed to have people who really are of good, good, positive um, influence in my life. Linda, when you first started this in Kenya, did you have any idea that you would be going to the world's most populated country soon? No, I didn't. In fact, if you would have asked me what was our next country, I don't think I would have said China. <laughs> but How'd you get there? Um, friends who are Chinese pointed out the need. Um, things I didn't recognize. I didn't realize that there were ethnic tribes in China. Mm -hmm. And if you are a girl from that ethnic tribe in some rural community, it's just as, um, as difficult as being an at-risk girl in a country like Kenya or um, Rwanda. And I, I didn't realize that until I visited. Mm -hmm. And when I visited that school, it was an all-girls school in the southern part of China near the Cambodian border, I saw the Marys, but they were Chinese. <laughs> and we interviewed our first 20. Um, we now have mentors and sponsors for those first 20, and they, they're going to be the first cohort. Oh, so wow. we can talk about them in a few years. <laughs> Are, do the, the mentors, um, do they have to speak the local language? They have to speak Mandarin for the China program. Mm -hmm. They do. Uh, whereas with uh, the Kenyan program, they don't, didn't necessarily need to, to speak uh, yeah. the local language. No, not necessarily, uh, because uh, in Kenya we have we have a vast knowledge of the English language. So from the very beginning that you're a kid, uh, in primary school, it's all, the, in the language of instruction is English. Um, and just to go back to your question, the first question that you asked Linda about how it, the global give back circle has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to point out that when we started, she might say that she didn't know what it was going to be, but, um, she always had a vision. She always, when you talk to her, she would always imagine something bigger for you as a girl, for maybe not the whole program, but she always had something bigger than what you are seeing right now. You know, when you're saying, okay, I want to get an A in this, she would say, you want to get an A not only in this, but also in this and this, because you're leading there, and I'm seeing you go there and become <laughs> a leader and become this. So she had a vision. Look at CGI in 2008 when we came here. Who knew that it would blow this big? But she always pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. So she had a really good vision that how that we worked. She worked so hard with the help of a lot of people, and here we are. Mm. Let's change the law. Lynn, it has to make you feel good, the fact that uh, you are helping s to have such positive impact on so many girls. You know what makes me feel better than that? That, that I have great partners. Um, I, I feel guilty when people think that I have the impact on all of these girls in Kenya. I came up with the idea. I came up with the concept. I came up with the model. But the Kenya Community Development Foundation, they mm -hmm. implement this on the ground. And they're the ones who need all the big hugs. You know, and everyone gives me all the accolades and all the hugs, but they do the day-to-day -day implementation. And the reason our program works is we look for local partners to implement. We have a local partner in China. We will have a local partner in India. And I give them the credit because I go there and for big ceremonies, everything's wonderful, I see all the good stuff, but they do the day-to-day -day little groundwork 
details that, that make these girls the way they are. So in other words, it's been easy for you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, having, having interviewed you several times, I know that that's not exactly true. But what have been some of the barriers that you've had to overcome in Kenya? Uh, they, we, we try to think of them as um, challenges, and one of the challenges, and you don't realize this until you're working on a project like this, we can't assume that we're the big, wonderful corporates and private sector and individuals who have to come and save these girls in, in Kenya. Their communities need to be a part of that process. And one of the things we learned, and we learned it through working with the Kenya Community Development Foundation, mm -hmm. yes, we may have been able to get a scholarship to take this local girl through, but the best thing you can do is you meet with her community and say, do you want to pitch in too? Mm -hmm. And they love to mm -hmm. do that. Even if they can only give $10, they need to be a part of her transformation. So that was a big learning personally. Um, I think had we not paid attention to it, it probably would have been a barrier for us. But we're embraced in Kenya and because we've made it their program. Mm -hmm. Mary, you talked about your mother being such an inspiration for you. <laughs> Let me ask this. Are you different than so many of the girls in Kenya? No. <laughs> Um, that was a quick no, uh, but I think um, I, I'm not different from any girl in Kenya. Um, we share the same visions, we share the same dreams of successful lives, um, a better tomorrow. It's just um, the people who put into your life. It, it, it differs who puts in it into your life and what kind of influence they have into your life. I'm not any different from my sisters, the girls in the program, or any. Um, it just we have different capabilities, different. Um, we've been blessed with different talents, and all of us express it in different ways. So, if a twelve-year-old girl were uh, in Kenya were to ask you, Mary, should I become part of the Global Give Back Circle? What would you say? Yes, 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 yes. Um, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. Linda, do you feel like you have hundreds of daughters now? I do. You know I don't have children. <laughs> but people ask me if I have children, I say, oh, I have about 600 of them. So <laughs> You've been busy. <laughs> I've been busy. <laughs> but speaking of daughters, I, I, the most important thing for me when Mary graduated was to make sure that her mother attended that graduation. And she did. She, we, she arrived in Dubai the day before, mm -hmm. and there's the most beautiful picture of Mary's mother with Mary, and her mother's head is on her shoulder, and her eyes are closed, and Mary's mm -hmm. eyes are closed, and it's so emotional. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful day. Rainmaker and as you grow That's up... That's what your life was. Yeah, you grow up being told that, you know, you, you, first of all, you're trained, actually, because you are the one sweeping the house, you're the one collecting water from the river, you're the one, you know, going to collect firewood, you're the one washing clothes for your siblings, you're the one who's taking care of the other mm -hmm. siblings. So, so there was that constant, did. yeah, I did that constantly, raising up my siblings and helping my mother. So I was in their lives that I knew that this is the role of a woman, and this is when I grow up, this is what I'm going to do. And, and so it's not even a question of, like, you're being... It's not even a question of like you know, it's, it's something that is just done. It's a it's it's a daily thing, okay. and so we you know when I was I think eight nine years old, like I helped my mother give birth. I mean those are things that were normal. Mm -hmm. um, it's being done in the community, so it's not it's not like oh this is how there is no separation. So you, you don't have to be trained that that. It, you're gonna be a wife, but you just it's just an automatic assumption. Like you just grow up into it. So yeah, well, and uh, every culture has, has its thing, own yeah. uh, things that happen. Yeah, uh, but you were going to school too. Yes, I was going to school. Um, one because my mother dropped out of school when she was four, in fourth grade. Okay. Yeah, and she always told me that when um, she was in school, she was very smart than most of the boys. And that time, her life was very difficult. She was having a very difficult life. And she she would tell me that if I went to school, I would be probably a very big figure in the community now. Because some of the boys that, you know, men that she went to school with, were, some of them were member of parliament, some of them were, um, you know, in the bank or, or, you know, they had a job that was really good. And she was thought that, you know, 
she went to school, that's what she could be. And then she but wanted us. in your us. culture, all she could be would be the wife of one of them. Yes. So. Yes. But did she aspire to be a member of parliament herself or something like that? Not really, because there was no such... Maybe she did. I believe that every child has a dream, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I can't really say that she thought that she would ever accomplish that mm. uh, because she, the best prize that anybody could have is to get married. That mm. was the ultimate But she wanted thing. something more for her, she wanted her some, oldest daughter. Yes. Especially. She wanted something different for all, all of us, actually. Um, she wanted us to go to school. She wanted us to... It was more like she wanted us to live the dream that she didn't live. Mm. And she, she, she made sure that we went to school. Um, made sure that even when we were chased home because of school fees, she made sure that even if it was a week later, we went back to school. Um, it was um, difficult uh, because sometimes um, we, she would take us along to work in people's farms so that we could get money to feed ourselves or to buy something for the school. Um, but she was persistent on us going to school. Mm. And, and that, um, you know, that was something that was special about and it. And your, your dad, was he <clears throat> making sure that you went to school at that time too? My dad worked as a policeman and he was never really home uh, as most army men are. Um, he traveled stayed in Nairobi and other places, but uh, he will come home once a year. Um, come home once a year? Once a year, <clears throat> sometimes for one week, sometimes for a month. So your mom was taking um, care of eight children and... Yes, so um, my dad was never really present. Um, he didn't, he wasn't present. In your culture, how uh, how long do you go to school? It's um. It's a, our school system is a year long, so you go and then you have a short break in April. Um, then I mean, would you go from first to the eighth grade and then go to high school? Oh yeah, that one is, uh, yeah, we have first to eighth and mm -hmm. then we have high school and mm -hmm. then university. But girls in your cultures, you didn't necessarily go. Most of us went to primary school, which is the first to eighth grade. Uh -huh. um, and what happened is that, you know, we find a lot of us in first, second, third grade. And by the time we're in fourth grade, uh, some of them start getting married. By the fourth time, grade? Yes. Fourth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Fourth <laughs> grade is like nine years old. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. You didn't get married at nine years old. No, 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 no. But was... you still saw your husband and your mother-in-law. Exactly, and exactly. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm, thank you very much for talking about this. We have to get to the tough part. When I was young, there was a very impactful ad campaign. The tagline, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. We should be thankful for those who overcome so much just to get to go to school. In the second episode of this two-parter, Kakenya reveals the trade she had to make with her community, the elders, and her father to become educated. It's all about the horrific practice of female genital mutilation. Join us for a look inside a little girl's world with a terrible tradition. Rainmaker believes we can change.